welcome everyone. I think that we're connected and just getting started here. Um, people are beginning to join, the numbers are going up. Um, and while that continues, I'll just say a few opening remarks. Um, I'm John McLaughlin, a professor of epidemiology at the University of Toronto and the National Executive Director of CANPATH, which is the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health. Uh, you'll hear more about CANPATH today from a great team uh, working with us in Saskatchewan. Um, before doing so, a, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, following the presentation or during the presentation, there will be um, an opportunity for questions uh, to be posted uh, using the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, we will post this uh, in the chat or uh, in the Q&A, but if you have any questions for or want to reach out to CANPATH, you can reach us at info at canpath.ca. And if you're interested as a researcher in accessing the data, uh, there's uh, you can uh, go to our website or um, check, uh, check in with us at access at canpath.ca. And there's also, um, it's also um, great if you uh, in, join us uh, through Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. An important uh, uh, moment uh, to reflect, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous Peoples on which the CANPATH National Coordinating Centre here at the University now stands. The territory was the subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. With CANPATH having teams working all across Canada from coast to coast, we also acknowledge the ancestral territories that are home to the many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful for the opportunity to work on this land. We have three members of, the, of our collaborative team in Saskatchewan with us today who are operating Healthy Future Sask. Um, they're joining us today to tell the story and present the challenges and opportunities of launching a provincial research platform. Healthy Future Sask will be a valuable resource, adding approximately 7,000 participants to the CANPATH cohort. So, uh, I'll introduce the three uh, people, uh, the speakers, and then turn it over to them. Uh, these include Samantha Maple Toft. Uh, she's the operations lead, and she comes to the team with 10 years of healthcare leadership experience, having led many healthcare teams through complex system level challenges. Dr. Maya Vu is the program and policy consultant, and she brings her experience in health research in HIV, HCV, pulmonary disease, to her role at HFS. And Jin Zhang is the biosample coordinator. Um, uh, Jing is tasked with setting up the HFS uh, Healthy Future Sask Study Center and Processing Lab for data collection, transportation, processing, and storage of participant biosamples. They each bring a unique perspective to the discussion, and we're looking forward to uh, celebrating their launch uh, in Saskatchewan uh, through today's uh, webinar. So over to you, and thank you. Thank you, John, for that introduction. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen. All righty, good morning, everyone. My name is Samantha Maple Toft, and I'm the Provincial Manager of Healthy Future Sask. I'm here today with Maya Vu and Jing Zhang. They will introduce themselves further on in the presentation. Today, we will, take you be, we will be taking you through the process of launching our CANPATH Provincial Cohort. So and I've noticed a number of people here from the Cancer Agency, um, or Saskatchewan Cancer Agency, who may not be familiar with CANPATH. So I just wanted to take a moment to give an overview of um, what, can, what CANPATH is all about. So CANPATH, known as Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health, is Canada's largest population health study. 
uh, Ken Path is studying the bio biology, behaviors, and environments of Canadians to learn more about chronic disease and cancer. As you can see on this map, we have cohorts all across the country. And currently, over 330,000 Canadians has provided data um, to our, our CanPath cohorts. So Saskatchewan is currently in its recruiting stages and is the last um, cohort to join CanPath. So it's taken us quite a while to get off the ground. Um, in spring 2018, the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency was approached by Cancer Care Manitoba and CanPath to launch a provincial cohort. In January 2019, there was a workshop and the key of that workshop was to discuss combining cohorts with Manitoba. I was not part of that discussion, but um, what I have been told is that it was held on a memorably cold day in Manitoba. But during this, uh, this time together, the decision was made for both provinces to run their own cohorts due to challenges with privacy, as well as moving data across provincial lines. So the first step in um, getting our cohort off the ground was to develop a proposal. And that proposal outlined our initial plan. So initially the plan was to um, partner with different health organizations across the province, which included our provincial health authority, our provincial lab, as well as some private organizations to help launch Healthy Future SASC. But as we know, in 2020, the pandemic kicked off and our partners could no longer commit to the workload given their pandemic priorities. So at that point, the decision was made to house the project fully within the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency. So one of the first steps in our proposal was to set up the governance structure for um, Healthy Future SAS to help guide the project. As you can see here, our governance structure is quite complex. The project is held accountable to the processes of CANPATH, um, but is also required to follow the practices of the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency, as well as our Provincial Privacy Commission. We are also accountable to the University of Saskatchewan Biomedical Ethics Research Board, as well as our Bioadvisory Safety Committee. But altogether, this governance structure will help manage the project from beginning to end. So Healthy Future SASC had um, the luxury of being the last cohort to launch. And with that, we got to learn a lot from all of the cohorts that went before us. So our goal was really to have a harmonized data set in at all angles. Our target was 703,000 participants. These participants will be aged from 30 to 74 years of age and they all must have a valid Saskatchewan health card. We will be collecting a consent form, the CANPATH core questionnaires, as well as blood sample, bio samples of blood and or saliva, as well as physical measurements. So once we decided that we've determined our governance structure and we had a target of what was to be collected, we decided to develop a three-phased approach. So here is a quick outline of our, um, our three-phase approach to keep our, get our project from launch to maintenance in use. So 2020 to 2021, we started the stakeholder engagement as well as um, standard operating procedure development. And we also had to realize that we needed significant amount of IT systems as well as software development. During our planning phase, we also got our regulatory approval and our pilot and evaluation. Currently, we are in our recruitment and collection. We launched February 1st, 2023, and our target is to recruit approximately 7,300 7, residents, as well as during this phase, we'll be securing funding for our phase two. Once we've completed our recruitment in fiscal year 25-26, we will be moving forward to maintenance and use. So Healthy Future SAS is um, Saskatchewan's first registered biobank. And as such, we had to decide how we wanted to function 
And we decided our objective was to develop an application or platform to help this research in recruiting participants, collecting their survey responses, biosamples, as well as physical measures. For security reasons and maintenance purposes, the decision was made to utilize um, few third-party applications and build many of our applications in-house. So from there, we had to think through, as we were going to build these in-house, what are the pieces that we wanted to build and how do we want to function? So as part of our IC, IT setup and development, we built the Healthy Future website. And the website includes detailed information about the initiative, as well as a toll-free number for our participants to contact. It's also where we're driving the participants um, to sign up and uh, to submit their consent for um, the study. The main idea up behind our website was to provide a centralized one-stop shop where participants could get information, as well as where we could host the survey. And by having the survey online, the participants are able to take the survey anytime that they want that fits their schedule and return back to it at their convenience. One other piece that we developed within the website was um, our study center appointment scheduler. So in wanting to be you know, as electronic as possible, we built this online scheduler where participants can go online and sign up for their study center visit. Um, as you can see here, they can decide, um, they can inform us what type of visit they want, whether they'd like to um, submit uh, a blood sample or bio sam or saliva, if they want a physical measure appointment, they get to select the location of that appointment, as well as choose a date and time that fits their, their life and their schedule. So this, platform did not exist at all. We, don't, we didn't have anything like this in the cancer agencies. So this is a first for us and it's really exciting. As well as having external functions, the um, study center scheduler has these internal functions. So this is an example of what we can see on our end. And it allows us to see who's scheduled for an appointment, what type of appointment, and where that appointment's being held. So we can ensure that the study center is ready and we have smooth flow for our participants. During our, our planning phases, we also decided that um, when we were going to disseminate the survey, we wanted to be a fully electronic survey with the option of paper when requested. REDCap was already purchased by the cancer agency and actively used by other departments. So the decision was made to move forward in using this application. Even though we were using REDCap, we still required um, the survey to be built from scratch. So when we think about the um, IT pieces around our website, our scheduler, um, the REDCap survey development, our consent form, Altogether, these IT systems took approximately one year to take from conceptualization, building, and then testing. So as part of our phase one, we really looked at how all of the flows were going to connect together. So while the participation, participant interfaces were being built, on the back end, we we're looking to figure out how all of the pieces of data were going to work together. So in the blue, you can see our participant flow. The orange is our biosample flow, and the green is our data flow. I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Maya to discuss the development and testing of our data flow. Thank you, Sam, for the history and background about Healthy Future SARS. Hi, everyone. My name is Maya. I'm the program and policy consultant for Healthy Future SARS. In the next few slides, Ching and I will go more detail in how data are collected and securely stored. If potential volunteers are interested in joining Healthy Future SARS, they can find information about this project on the website at healthyfuturesars.ca. In order to uh, participate in this project, volunteers have to provide us their consent. Together with the consent, we also collect um, their personal information, such as name, date of birth, 
address, personal health number to check for um, eligibility and for future follow-up. Once the consent is provided and enrollment criteria are met, a unique ID will be assigned to the participant. And from this step forward, all of the data collected either through the survey or at the study centers will be linked with this unique number, which is um, which does not contain any identifiable participant information. And only authorized people can have access to the, this kind of data. After completing the consent form and filling out the questionnaire, Participant can book a visit at the study center to um, provide additional data, such as physical measurements um, and bio samples or both. If participants are not able to visit the study center but still want to donate their bio samples, they can request for saliva kits to be mailed to their home. Consent form and questionnaire can be collected in three different approaches. Online consent and survey is the main tool of recruitment in the project through Health Future SAS website under the participant tab. The kind of information we capture in the questionnaire survey and in the future follow-up survey as well include demographic information, health status. We get um, information about um, changes in personal and family health status. We looked at uh, medical history, medication, metric measurements, and things like behavior, sleep, alcohol use, etc. All of the data collected will then be stored in our internal server, hosted inside the agency behind the firewall. If people don't prefer to do it online or if they have problem with internet access, they can request for paper packages to be sent home. A consent package will be sent first. Once we receive the consent and confirm the eligibility, a study ID will be generated and a study package with questionnaire will be sent out. No name or personal identifying information is recorded on the questionnaire form. Instead, there is a barcode affixed to the form, which is unique to that participant. After the consent form, uh, after the survey form is returned, all of the data will be then entered into our internal server, and all of the paper documents are stored in a locked cabinet in a physically secure area that requires a key card access. And and if people don't prefer to do it online or if they have any problem with um, internet access and if they want to um, come to the study center to join Healthy Future SARS, we also try to accommodate their request based on the availability of the study center. They can book a visit at the study center. Um, they can provide the consent and fill in the questionnaire either online or on paper, and they can donate physical measure and bio samples at the same visit. We have an online booking system to facilitate the appointment booking for study center visits on our website, as I mentioned. And um, there are two main designated study centers established in Saskatoon and Regina inside the agency facility. And we plan to relaunch this study center this March. We are also uh, monitoring the needs of mobile center and are investigating the visibility of opening mobile center for those who are not able to get to Saskatoon or Rich China. For the appointment, participants can choose to take physical measurements and give blood samples or either one of these. And the maximum time for um, uh, study center visit for both of the activities is 45 minutes. And we require an ID to establish the identity of the participant. And this is the setting of the study center. We have standardized equipment. We have mobile fridge to temporarily store the bio samples at the study center. So this slide will show you in details what will happen at the study center. We recommend participants to complete their questionnaire before coming in. And as mentioned, when people come to the study center, ID and um, health card number will be verified. The staff will confirm if there's a consent available or need to be obtained. Study nurse will ask some screening question to see if there are any contraindication for certain measurements, such as pregnancy or having medical device implant like pacemaker. 
some of the measurements about your height, your height, weight, uh, waist, and hip are already self-reported in the survey. However, at the study center, we um, provide nice measurements using standard equipment for such measures. And extra measurements are collected at the study centers, including blood pressure, heart rate, grip strength, and the use of um, in-body equipment to analyze your body, such as percentage of fat, water, muscle in your body. And all of the data collected will then be entered into red cap database located in the uh, our internal server. In the next few slides, Chin will talk more about bio samples collection, how we process, store, and um, protect our biological data. And I now will turn it over to Chin, our bio sample coordinator. Jing, you're muted. Oh, Jing, I don't think we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, somehow I uh, lost the unmute button from my screen, strangely. <laughs> thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Jing, and uh, I'm the biosample coordinator of Healthy Future SASC. Uh, I'm going to tell you our workflows <coughs> around biosample, uh, collecting, uh, shipment, processing, uh, and storage. So in the study center, uh, after physical measurements, the participants can proceed to donate their biosamples, preferably blood. Um, <clears throat> they will be asked a series of screening questions for just to ensure their health and the safety. For example, if a participant is taking blood thinner or they have donated blood in the past 24 hours, we won't draw blood from them. And if everything is okay, uh, we will ask them things like uh, the last time they took coffee or um, uh, alcohol, uh, it's just to associate these status with their bio samples. Uh, blood is drawn by arm venipuncture, and uh, this is actually our scientific director, Rias, and our study nurse during the pilot, Pat, and thank you for modeling. Um, so we take four tubes of blood, uh, a total of 37 uh, milliliters, uh, which is around two and a half tablespoons. The blood tubes are labeled with barcodes only. And uh, these barcodes are associated with participant ID and no personal information would appear on these labels. Uh, these blood will be, uh, after drawing, they will be locked into our databases and they will be centrifuged and stored at four degree until shipment. If for any reason, uh, blood drawing is not possible. They can, participants can always donate saliva instead. Salivas are collected by spitting into this collector tube and uh, they will be logged and uh, uh, stored for shipment as well. After bowel sample donation, participants are free to go and the bio sample will be packed and shipped by the end of the day. The reason that we need shipment is because, and, okay, our oper it's because our operating centers are sort of all over the place. <laughs> Uh, so the province of Saskatchewan has two uh, urban centers, Saskatoon and Regina. Uh, the two cities are two and a half hours driving away apart, and uh, they accommodate roughly half of the, uh, of the province's total population. So we set up study centers in each of the two cities, so they are more, they're accessible to more people. 
And uh, even within Saskatoon, our processing lab is 20 minutes driving from our study centers. So therefore we need to arrange shipment uh, between our study centers and the processing lab. At the end of every day, the study center staff will pack all the biosamples collected during that day. Uh, and they to keep the samples between two to eight degrees Celsius degrees, they are packed with ice uh, cold packs and also packed our data loggers. So data loggers will uh, capture temperatures every five minutes uh, through the night until we receive them at the lab and download the data. This way we have a record of the overnight temperature. And uh, if, um, if the temperatures are beyond ranges, above or below two to eight degrees, uh, we still admit the samples, process them and store them, but we make a note in our uh, database so the researchers would know. So here is our processing lab. It's located in the health science building of University of Saskatchewan. Uh, on the left is the picture of the lab bench where we do most of the work. And on the right is uh, me, Ali coating blood samples in the biosafety cabinet. So here's what happens in the lab. We receive the shipment overnight and the samples will be validated against the records in the database. They will be centrifuged uh, to fractionate into phases. Serum, plasma, buffy coat, and the red blood cells will be collected and aliquoted into matrix tubes. So this is what they look like. So these tubes are, has capacity of one milliliters and um, they are printed, uh, they have barcode printed on them by the manufacturers. So that's how each tubes are identified. The, these barcodes are linked with participant, participant IDs in our databases, and they are not linked to any personal information. Actually, in the lab side of the database, everything is only linked to participant ID. Personal info is not recorded in this side of the databases. All the lab staff, including myself, uh, don't have access to the key file where the participant ID uh, and the personal info is linked. If uh, so, there's no way whatsoever that I can figure out which blood tubes belongs to which person. Uh, each participant will have 18 aliquots of blood samples, and they are split into two freezers. That's just in case if one freezer has problem and the samples are compromised, we still have some backup samples for that participant. And these are the freezers where we store uh, our bio samples. So they're both minus 80 freezers. The freezers are on the same campus as the processing lab, but in different buildings. There's about 15 minutes walking between them. Uh, so we're expecting over 90,000 tubes of blood samples from around maybe 5,000 participants. And uh, these freezers are located in a secure space within Saskatchewan Cancer Agency. Uh, they are locked. They require access card to be opened and only limited uh, staff has that access card. The integrated system of these freezers record all activities such as uh, door opening, uh, any temperature failure, any alarm activated. And they so we always have an audit trail. Um, and they are under a 24 seven monitoring system. So if there's any temperature failure, if, if the temperature ever rises above minus 65 degrees, uh, a, alarm will be activated, staff will be notified and a CO2 backup system will kick in to keep the temperature down while we uh, figure out the problem. 
our goal is to have the samples frozen within 36 hours of collecting. Mm -hmm. My screen just moved for no reason. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, the goal is 36 hours within uh, to freeze a sample within 36 hours. And uh, it's uh, so far we've achieved that goal. But if ever it took it takes longer than that, uh, we still admit the sample process and store them. But uh, again, we make a note in the database so the researchers know. And uh, yes, so these are the plans so far that we developed uh, based on other cohorts' experiences and uh, the resources available to us. And to, to test that these plans are feasible and efficient, we ran a, uh, a pilot last year. Sam is going to tell you some summary of the pilot and some lessons learned. And uh, back to you, Sam. Thanks, Jing. So now that we had all of our um, processes in place, our data flow all organized, we chose to pilot um, our project to ensure that we would um, we don't have any bumps in the road before launch. So in March 2022, we started our pilot. The pilot was open to cancer agency staff, family, and friends, and we only promoted it through our internal cancer agency communication. So we total number of pilots up in, sorry, the total number of participants enrolled in our pilot was 59. And of those 59 individuals who completed the survey, 34 of them visited our studies, um, our study center where we were able to collect 30 bio uh, blood samples, five saliva samples and 33 physical measurements assessments were completed. So our target, we were anticipated that approximately 68% of participants would provide a biosample. Um, in actuality, during our pilot, approximately 60% um, provided a biosample. And this could be due to the fact that we had limited appointments available um, and you know, just the um, length of time between the fact when we started the pilot and when the pilot was completed. Um, the one thing that was really helpful for us is that all the pilot participants were given a survey to evaluate their experience with their online questionnaire and the study center visit. And these really helped us to improve the, the participant experience and ensure that we had really streamlined flow. So during the pilot, we had a number of challenges revealed. So the first was our staffing. So we started the pilot in March of 2022, but we did not complete the pilot until November. And that was because we really had some struggles securing nursing staffing to support our study center visits. So this really required us to um, coordinate with our point of care teams so to find a nurse that we would be able to support the needs of the study center. One of the another challenge we had was that it is um, we held our pilot during winter in Saskatchewan. So as anybody who lives in Saskatchewan knows that snowstorms um, close highways and this is not an infrequent occurrence. So we had scheduled um, uh, study sample uh, bio sample appointments in Regina and our the highway was closed and our nurse was not able to travel from the Saskatoon to Regina. So we had to think fast, contact all of our participants and reschedule those appointments. Another challenge that we um, identified was the courier piece. So as Jing mentioned, we need our samples to travel from um, Regina to Saskatoon, as well as travel within Saskatoon. Um, and arranging this proved to be quite challenging because we had to organize our schedule to accommodate the, the delivery pickup uh, cutoff times. So we really had to work backwards from when the uh, courier team could pick up, um, was required to pick up the samples to then arranging our appointments. And the last challenge that we had was really around the space. Um, space is a premium within our organization and we were able to find a permanent location in Saskatoon, but we are still on the hunt for permanent study center space in Regina. With regards to pilot learnings, 
uh, are one of the big pieces is around communication, not only communication within our own team, but communication with participants. Uh, we found that when we were able to reach out to our participants more and let them know where we were in our um, pilot, it really did help to increase engagement. We also learned a lot about um, our sample integrity. Uh, we did have some samples some blood samples that experienced hemolysis early on in our pilot. And what we did from there was really work through our standard operating procedures, as well as um, our uh, packing and shipping uh, procedures to ensure that we were able to stabilize our blood samples. During pilot, we were able to streamline our workflow. Our initial appointments were approxim approximately one hour long. And by the end of um, pilot, our, bio our study center appointments were less than 45 minutes, which is a huge win for us, because it means we'll, we will allow be able to get more people through the study center every day. Um, we had some challenges, like I had mentioned earlier, around the shipment of our biosamples. Um, we needed to ensure that we utilized a courier that had access to temperature control storage in the event of a highway closure. Um, we wanted to make sure that the sample integrity was maintained and had to partner with a very specific courier company. So currently, we use one courier for our shipment from Regina to set the Saskatoon Processing Center, and then another courier um, for our shipment from Saskatoon Study Center to the Saskatoon Processing Center. One piece that was really a, like a huge uh, win for us was around our uh, data applications. So none of our applications experienced downtime during our pilot. So this really proved that all of the work in organizing, developing um, our applications really did work out to our benefit. So during phase one of the pilot, um, while all the other pieces were being developed, we also uh, leveraged the relationship that the cancer agency had with Phoenix Media Group to help develop the visual identity of Healthy Future Sask. So they worked with us on developing our cohort name, which is Healthy Future Sask. Our tagline is Tomorrow's Health Together. And below you'll see the four colorways of our logo. Once our pilot was complete and we were able to kind of hone in our pilot processes, we also reached out to Phoenix Media Group to um, help us in designing and launching our awareness campaign. So our goal of the awareness campaign is not only to get participants enrolled in the study, but also to create buzz and let the people of Saskatchewan know that Healthy Future is here and we are ready to launch. So we used a number of different platforms to help us uh, create awareness. So as you can see here in January, we started our online uh, campaign right before launch. Um, and as well as our digital boards. So there's a bunch of those really big highway um, boards that promote healthy future. And then in March, we will be launching our print, TV and radio campaigns. And the key pieces about these is that our, especially our print will be all across the province to ensure that we are um, reaching not only just our urban centers, but also our rural communities. So here is an example of one of our billboards. So the goal is you know, to create a name for Healthy Future, to draw people to the website, as well as to link our project to the cancer agency. So here is our first billboard. And this is our second billboard that's on, you can see on one of our freeways. So this is uh, really appealing to the people of Saskatchewan that the research project needs them. And hopefully it draws people to our website. On during on our social media um, campaign, we also pulled together a commercial, which we're really proud of. And once again, the goal is to appeal to the people of Saskatchewan. So this ad runs on YouTube and other social media venues, and we're very proud of it. And so far, we've had lots of eyes on this commercial. So I just wanted to take a moment to share it with all of you.
As part of a Canada-wide 50-year study, Healthy Future Sask is creating a lasting legacy of health for future generations. And you can help. Participants will fill out health and lifestyle questionnaires, donate cell samples like blood or saliva, and take physical measurements a few times throughout the research project. Participation today could mean the world for generations to come. Help create Saskatchewan's healthy future. Yeah, we're incredibly proud of that. And every time I see that commercial on my YouTube, I get chills and it's just such an exciting time for us. So our initial recruitment stat strategy for participants, um, you know, we worked through Agency Matters. We have launched our provincial ad campaign. We are, have right now social media and web advertisements running. We had a news release on our launch day of February 1st. And to date, we've done one um, radio interview with our scientific director, and we're looking at how, scheduling a number of other television interviews to really um, work around being a public interest story of the province. In future, we're looking at sponsorship opportunities, as well as speaking events and community engagement to really get the name of Healthy Future out within the province. I think once again, the luxury that we have um, as being the last cohort is that we can learn from our partners um, and we're really looking them, to them to identify what strategies worked for them and potentially replicate those within the Saskatchewan context. So where are we today? Uh, we launched February 1st, 2023 with our awareness campaign. We had our first 100 participants enrolled by February 4th, which was really exciting for us um, and it kind of put a little gave us a little bit of momentum. Um, we are currently monitoring the reach on our websites and our social media platforms to see how many people are actually how many unique views we're getting and how many people are seeing our ad campaign. I think for us right now the gap is bridging those views into signups. Um, we're really going to need to work with our communications team to uh, figure out how we not only um, create awareness of the campaign, but bring participants to sign up. So right now we are in phase two of our recruitment. Our next steps includes um, hiring of some staff. So we'll need to hire a lab tech to manage our help um, support Jing and managing our biosamples. Uh, we'll need to hire a nurse for our study center as well as an admin to help navigate some of the questions, all the automated emails, all that kind of um, nitty gritty work that we'll need to help keep the uh, project moving forward. Uh, and then once we get steadily into our, our uh, recruitment, we'll need to secure financial support for phase three, which is 20, uh, 2026 and beyond to follow our cohort for 50 years. So I am incredibly proud of the work that our team has done. And as you can see over the past four years, it's been a significant amount of work uh, to get everything rolling and off the ground. So I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge our team, Riaz, our scientific director, Maya, our program and policy consultant, Jing, our biosample coordinator, Corey, our communications consultant, Kathambari, our applications analyst, Nikkei, our business analyst, and myself, our provincial manager. So last but not least, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge um, all the teams that helped support us getting us um, to our where we are today. Like I said many times, being the last cohort, we had lots to learn from and lots of support along the way. So a big shout out goes to all of the cohorts that came before us, as well as our host organ organization, SAS Cancer, a big thank you to them, as well as the University of Saskatchewan and our provincial privacy commission. Uh, a giant thank you and acknowledgement goes to CanPath for all the support along the way, as well as the University of Toronto and the Canadian, Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. And last but not least, a big thank you goes out to all of our pilot participants. They were instrumental in allowing us to hone our processes and really prepare for um, launch. And now I'm gonna turn the floor over to uh, our audience to see if there's any questions. Thank you, uh, Samantha Mai and Jing. That's a tremendous accomplishment. And uh, 
It's uh, great to hear your presentation while you're still in the first month of your official launch. So congratulations on that. Um, there are a couple of questions that have been posted, which I can point your way of. Uh, one is, uh, what percent of participants are you expecting to get uh, a blood sample from? So ideally, we'd like 68% um, of our participants to uh, either provide a blood or saliva sample. Our pilot, we were a little bit lower than that, but um, that is what we're going to target. So I think once we get rolling and we open our study center, if we see that we are um, not reaching those thresholds, we're going to have to evaluate um, how we book our appointments and whether we need to figure out an additional strategy um, to get people into our clinics to uh, provide a physical measure and biosample appointment. Thank you. And a related question is, what will be done with those uh, blood samples? Uh, Jing outlined very nicely the kind of the storage and the processing. And the uh, a question raised is, are, is there any testing being done, such as CBC or um, hemoglobin A1C? Um, if so, do you have a process for alerting someone about abnormal results? So where have you landed on that? I'm gonna hang that one over to Jing because she knows all, all things biosample. <laughs> yeah, the answer is simple, no. We don't do any testing uh, or any kind of analysis right after collecting. So uh, everything goes to storage until somebody or some researchers request them for their projects. Yep. We do, sorry, um, I just wanna to add to J uh, Jing's answer. We do work with the University of um, of University of Saskatchewan to test the sample integrity. So we do um, send them uh, a the next gen sequencing facility, a sample of our um, bio samples, and they test them to make sure it meets the CAMPATH requirements. Thank you. And then just uh, for the audience to know that the approach that uh, has been described by uh, Healthy Future SAS Group is uh, as uh, Samantha has said, has been well informed by the experience in the other provinces, but also their approach is consistent with which which has been done. I think the 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 main focus is to establish the relationship with participants, collect the data, collect the biospecimens, store it securely, and then the future and analyses can be done um, uh, with the in further investment that will come uh, from the research community itself. Two other questions have been posted. So for those who declined providing a sample, do you happen to ask why they declined? No, we do not. Um, we respect people's ability to say that they want to participate participate or not. We are just really happy to um, have people join the study at whether, with the level of participation that they're willing to give. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, um, um, a person has asked, um, when will there be mobile centers available for rural participants? So that has been something, that's an idea that we have in the works. We don't really know what that looks like right now. Um, also, we'll have to secure funding for that piece. But we know in Saskatchewan, we have many people that live in our rural communities, and we don't want to leave them out of providing a biosample. So the team is going to be working on figuring out what is our best option for um, getting those biosamples from Saskatchewan residents who live in rural communities. Um, and a question of, um, if the blood sample quality does not meet the requirements, um, would the participant be informed? My understanding is, um, what do you mean quality, like the quality of well, I, th path or... yeah. I think uh, it maybe it came up more in, in your pilot phase where you did detect a bit of a challenge with hemolysis and that sort of thing. Well, so I think the implication is that um, sometimes the quality control work is done um, and uh, it sounds to me like you've uh, revised your protocols in order to ensure that highest quality of specimen is now being maintained. Um, would that be a fair conclusion? Yes, that is correct. And we do, um, I think when we noticed that we had that challenge with the quality of our sample, you know, the team really 
came together and tried to identify and pinpoint mm -hmm. why that was happening. Um, one of the, it's a kind of a funny story, but Jing is required to take those bio samples and walk them 15 minutes. And it was over cobblestone um, within the hallway. So they were, those samples were being rattled around and we didn't know if that was actually part of what was causing some of our challenges. So now we have a different way of moving the samples from one site to another. Yeah, that's a very precautionary, well done. I could answer one of the questions uh, because it sort of preceded your, your involvement on this, but a question has been asked about whether biospecimen collection can be expanded to include urine samples or other matrices. And indeed, when CANPATH and the regional cohorts were designed, um, a wider range of biospecimen uh, collections and processing was piloted very successfully, including urine samples, because it's recognized that ideally we would be able to um, measure other analytes uh, to detect um, um, environmental exposures and uh, other, other aspects. However, that work was never funded. So the, um, the ability to collect the bios, the blood samples that you've done is a tremendous advance for Canada, uh, but uh, only with additional funding would it be possible for Saskatchewan or even the other provinces to collect the other biospecimens. Um, maybe I can ask a question. Um, so, Samantha, you introduced at the beginning the um, the uh, kind of the the concerns about uh, sharing of, of health information across provincial boundaries, um, and um, the reason for the design of CanPath as it is, as you indicated, was because of those concerns. It seemed to be best for some Saskatchewan and Manitoba to continue to do things within their provincial boundaries. And the design of the enterprise is based on the fact that once people have participated, you have in fully informed consent to allow information to be put into um, uh, federated or uh, sh shared national databases such as CANPA. Um, in your experience of developing the protocol, uh, now doing the pilot work, do you feel that, um, do you find that any people are concerned about the uh, information that you're collecting being shared beyond the provincial border? You know, noting again that this is being done with informed consent. Any thoughts on that? I have not um, experienced any direct questions about that. I don't know, Maya works very closely with our participants. Maya, has anybody come to you about that concern? Um, no, the answer is no. I don't have um, any specific concern about data sharing um, across the border at all at this time point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, um, my, th my three decades of experience are the same with, uh, so, you know, it's really, as long as we have an active relationship with people and a solid informed consent, that, um, that concern actually is being well managed. And then um, there's not another question. There are quite a few comments where people have congratulated you, and I'd, I'd like to uh, do that as well. In particular, uh, the three presentations you gave really did highlight very nicely what you are doing to ensure protection of privacy, to ensure the, the personal information is separate, that the quality of the data is rock solid, the quality of the biospecimens is, is solid. So congratulations on all of that work to build such secure, effective systems which I know, um, which I think the whole audience could appreciate is um, the reason why it's taken you a, a year or two to actually launch. So all of that hard work is now behind you. And so again, congratulations on the successful launch. Thank I'll you. just sort of pause there to see if there are any other points that you would like to, um, any one of you would like to, to raise while the audience is adding additional questions. I would just like to say that I'm the newest addition to this team and I joined an incredibly highly functioning group of people. So I just wanna say that they are all amazing and a big thank you to, for all of their hard work and dedication to the project. Thank you, Samantha. I think, um, you know, I can sort of say the same. I'm really impressed by the team that you've established um, the, uh, the, 
as I said, getting to that launch and getting to that first 100 participants, which you were able to do in four days uh, when you did launch, those are tremendous milestones. And um, the coming year or two of full recruitment uh, looks like it's on a good, good path and trajectory. And you know, we at the National Coordinating Center, but everyone across CANPATH uh, look forward to working with you. Um, maybe the final thing I could add would be that amongst the participants on today's call, please um, know for those of you who are uh, researchers or students or trainees that the data that um, the Saskatchewan group is collecting is exactly for the research community to be making use of. So please be, be giving some thoughts to what one could do to now be able to study the health of Canadians, including every single province with um, Saskatchewan having been added. So um, I don't see any other questions emerging, but I think uh, what that could lead us to is a, um, a showing of uh, gratitude and uh, applause because we can recognize the quality of the work, the importance of it, and the um, great accomplishments that you've made. There are a couple of um, points that have been posted in the chat if people would like to uh, click on links uh, to either connect with CANPATH or to um, uh, to go to the website and see um, uh, how to access the data or uh, what's happening in the other provinces as well. And so with that, uh, Samantha, uh, Maya, and Jing, uh, congratulations again. Um, excellent webinar, seminar today. Um, thank you for leading it. And we look forward to seeing your work progress even further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>